Hey everyone, we're here to talk about Gothic art and architecture. Before we can do that though, we need to set up a few things going on in historical context that will really help us to understand what is driving the trends that we see in the art and especially the architecture of this era. So first of all, let's define what the era is and kind of the time frame that it encompasses. The Gothic is a name that is assigned back to this time period and to this style, and it is a name for a style, just like we talked about with the Romanesque. Uh, rather than being named for a certain geographic area or a certain time frame, this is um, a movement that's all about the style of the art and the architecture. Also like the Romanesque, it is international in its nature. We just have to remember that during the Romanesque, we had a few things that made trade more, or sorry, that made travel rather more common in the era. Those things are continuing in the Gothic. And so travel is much more common than it had been in the past. And as people travel, they spread ideas and they spread style. So if you remember when we talked about the Romanesque, we talked about uh, Crusades, we talked about the Norman Conquest, uh, and that was one way that the Romanesque was spread. And that's not necessarily as applicable to the Gothic. But we also talked about the increase in trade over sea and over land. And we especially talked about pilgrimage. And all of these are things uh, that impacted the spread of ideas in the Romanesque. And many of them continue into the Gothic and continue to make travel more common and allow those ideas and styles to spread. The time frame that we're talking about when all this international kind of style is spreading is about 1140 uh, to 1400. And it just depends on the area that you're talking about. It starts later in some areas. It ends earlier in some areas. For instance, in Italy, it starts later and ends earlier there than it does in other areas of Europe. It starts in France, uh, just as the Romanesque was a French style. And in fact, uh, the Gothic in its own time was often called the French work. Um, there are about 80 Gothic cathedrals constructed in France in the 13th century. And so there's quite a few of them there. And of course, over the course of the entire, entire period, we get hundreds of cathedrals, thousands of churches. Uh, more stone was quarried in France alone during the Gothic period than during the entire 3000 year Egyptian period and all the monumental stone architecture that they did there. So just to kind of give you a taste of how many churches are being built at this point in time, it's a whole bunch and that's just from France. So beyond that, even throughout Europe, there are, are very many as well. They want to build these churches for the same sorts of reasons that uh, the architects and towns were interested in building churches in the Romanesque. Not only was it a mark of civic pride, right, and a way to attract tourism and benefit your economy through pilgrimage. We talked about that quite a bit with the Romanesque. That's all applicable to the Gothic. But of course, it was spiritually beneficial to, to these people to have these beautiful churches constructed with wonderful relics inside. They could have that in close proximity to themselves and to their cities. Uh, the Gothic is a time when we do have larger cities and actually new cities are being um are being uh, created during this time period. Uh, and this is actually a part of understanding the history of the era. And the reason that we have so many more cities and the cities are growing is that we get a population boom. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. We get better crop yields, more food, less hunger, uh, better farming tools also helps with the more food. So, um, and also what's interesting about having better farming tools and better farming practices is that one farmer can produce more food and that leaves um, leaves some opportunities for people to leave that as a profession and, and take up other professions in cities. So we're getting kind of an urban growth. Here's just a chart that gives you an idea of what we're talking about here with the population growth during the era. You can see that this chart goes all the way from about 4000 BCE uh, up to about 1600 CE. And look at that spike towards the end. So you can see the Romanesque on there, right, which is roughly 1000 to 1200. And then remember the Gothic starts just a little bit before that. Uh, and goes to about 1400. So there's that big, huge bump right in that time period. And part of that is happening during the Romanesque, but part of it's also happening, the majority of it is happening during the Gothic. And then can you see right after or right towards the end of the Gothic, we get that big dip. That's gonna be the Black Plague 
and then things are going to kind of take off from there. So growing cities are a part of understanding the Gothic. More people, more economic prosperity, more money to build churches, more desire to, you know, attract pilgrims to come to your town to spend their tourist dollars to come and see your relics and to see your beautiful cathedral. And so it becomes really competitive. Um, and one thing that's really interesting is that where we had that sense of competition in the Romanesque, in the Gothic, one thing that was particularly competitive was the height of the structure. And we'll talk quite a bit about why height was so important to uh, Gothic architects, but they were specifically trying to create taller and taller structures. So what's really wonderful to realize is that because we have this large population growth and because we have larger cities and because we have all these economic benefits, that means we have a population that has the money to build big churches. And not only do they have the money, but they also have the desire. And what's fascinating about the Gothic is that we can really trace that desire back to um, a fundamental figure that switches the trends from the Romanesque into the Gothic. And his name is Abbot Suje. Okay, Abbot Suger was an influ influential figure both in politics and in the religious sphere of the day. He was even a regent for the time when the king was gone, so he pretty much ran the country while the king was gone. He was the abbot of the Church of Saint-Denis, which was the church where the French kings and queens were crowned. Uh, Saint-Denis was also the patron saint of France, so that was a very important pilgrimage site as well. It had the relics of Saint-Denis, so it was an important political site, this church where he was um, in charge, and an important religious site. One of the reasons that we know so much about him, in addition to his reputation, is that he wrote a book. It's called The Book of Sujet, and in it he explains kind of his ideas on architecture. Uh, and these ideas um, were ideas that he put into practice when he oversaw the remodeling of the church at Saint-Denis. Uh, and it became really the starting point of the Gothic era. It's pretty rare for us to be able to point to one work of art or one work of architecture as the starting po point of a new style and movement, but that's definitely the case here with the Gothic and Abbot Suger was a fundamental figure in that. So we're gonna talk here about a couple of ideas that Suger emphasized that become key to understanding the Gothic style. The first idea was his emphasis on light. Uh, he was one who felt, just as the early Christians, that light had mystical properties and that light could be a reflection of God's divinity. Uh, he reads the text of a figure. Um, he thinks that the text is from Saint Denis, right? The, the patron saint of the church that he's in charge of. But really, the text is written by someone called Pseudo Dionysus the Areopagite. You can see that term right there. Um, and he is an early Christian mystic. But in this text that Suje thought was Saint Denis writing, Pseudo Dionysus really talks about light as a physical manifestation of God. Um, and so, you know, we've talked quite a bit about that already with early Christianity. And so now it's going to get a renewed emphasis here underneath Abbot Suje. Well, what he does is he builds on that just a little bit. Okay? He says, yes, that's a great idea. Light can kind of remind us or is a physical way to show God's divinity, but we should make sure that it's not just any normal light. And what he does is he emphasizes light that comes through stained glass and he calls this Lux Nova. So the light as it's filtered in through stained glass uh, is really honestly just incredibly beautiful. If you had the chance to experience some stained glass windows, they're one of my favorite works of art just for the mood that they can convey to you and the experience that they offer. So he gets this stained glass illuminated by the light and now all of a sudden it's special light, right? It's not just normal everyday light. And he thinks that that is way more suitable to convey God's divinity. There's another reason though, why he liked stained glass. And one of the other or one of the other things that Abbot Suger really emphasized was creating an atmosphere in the church that was going to be an atmosphere of the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, this isn't necessarily a new idea either, right? Just as the emphasis on light was not a new idea, but it is one that's going to get renewed emphasis because of Abbot Suger and 
um, how much importance he assigned to it. So the idea of the heavenly Jerusalem, it's essentially um, an idea that was heavily emphasized by St. Augustine. Um, sometimes it can be called the city of God. It's pretty much just like a, a meeting place between heaven and earth, like where you can experience something that's more heavenly. And there's all sorts of religious texts uh, that are centered on this. Uh, and there have been other times when they wanted to have churches feel like that otherworldly place, right? And we've talked already about that back to the time of early Christianity. But this idea specifically of the heavenly Jerusalem is related to stained glass because the heavenly Jerusalem, according to the religious texts, was paved in gold and um, decorated with jewels. And so you can look at these stained glass windows and you can automatically make that connection, right, of the jewels of the heavenly Jerusalem because that light that comes through the colored glass is very jewel-like and luminescent and uh, really kind of reminiscent of that. Okay, so the stained glass was not only a way to create Lux Nova, this, you know, otherworldly divine light that was meant to remind us of God, but the stained glass was also a tool to create this atmosphere within the church that made it feel like the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, what we're going to see um, is that the churches, if you kind of look down at that last little entry there, are going to be elaborately decorated, just as they were in the Romanesque, and they're going to do a lot with gold. And a lot of this doesn't survive today, but lots of gold objects inside the church, um, lots of gold uh, accents painted on the walls of the church. Um, we have to remember that the Romanesque and the Gothic churches were usually painted inside and out, which we haven't talked a lot about yet, but we will be talking about today. So um, creating a really rich, luxurious kind of feeling inside the churches was another way to kind of evoke the idea of the heavenly Jerusalem, especially by using gold, since the text said that it had both gold and jewels. Okay, so those two things working together to create heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, well, there's one more thing that Abbot Suger is really going to emphasize as a tool to create this idea of the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, and that's mathematics. Okay, so um, we're going to see that math has an increased importance in Gothic structures. We already said that math, um, mathematical unity and geometric kind of stability was something that was more important in Romanesque churches. They're going to take that to another more precise level in the Gothic. They're going to be better engineers. They're going to have a better understanding of mathematics and how to create harmonious ratios within the design of these churches as works of architecture. So all of that emphasis on math is going to be something that's significant for understanding Gothic cathedrals. And we'll talk more about that as we go throughout our discussion. But one thing we need to understand specifically is that according to St. Augustine, Heavenly Jerusalem had a specific height. Like the heights of, I think it's the walls that surround the city. And it's 144 feet. Okay, so we're going to see that number of 144 feet is like the holy grail for these Gothic architects. They want to construct a church that is 144 feet tall. And we'll see that quite a few of them do it. Uh, and then they even try to surpass that. So these ideas of the heavenly Jerusalem are really key to understanding what Abbot Suger was emphasizing in his texts. Uh, and when we understand that, we can see how Gothic, Gothic architecture changes as a way to accommodate this. Because the engineering that we had in the Romanesque couldn't accommodate a lot of windows, right? They had really small windows because the walls were so heavy and the, and the ceilings were so heavy, they just couldn't open up all that space and keep structural integrity. Uh, and so to achieve these effects of the heavenly Jerusalem that Abbot Suger was so advocating, architects had to move into a new style. They had to use the pointed arch. They had to use the flying buttress as a way to open up the walls and allow those large stained glass windows. They had to use the pointed arch and use the flying buttress as a way to try and get structures up to that magical number of 144 feet because Romanesque engineering couldn't allow for that high of a structure. It was too heavy or that open of a wall space, right? Because it wasn't uh, strong enough to hold all that weight up. So these ideas of Abbot Suger are just incredibly important to understanding why it was that we started to embrace new forms of architecture and have new goals in architecture. And these are really the forms and the goals that completely identify Gothic architecture.
What's interesting about math is that not only were they really emphasizing that 144 feet as a height, uh, and that comes from not only St. Augustine's uh, discussion of the city of God and the heavenly Jerusalem, but also it comes from the book of Revelations. Uh, so that's a really important mathematic number, but there's other ways that they're trying to incorporate math into their structures. And they're specifically looking to the Bible uh, and they're using ratios and numbers of different holy structures described in the Bible. And they're trying to use those same measurements, but they're also using other kinds of Christian numbers that have traditionally had mathematic uh, symbolism. So this emphasis on math is not only due to Abbot Sujay and his ideas about the heavenly Jerusalem, but there's also just a more widespread understanding of math at this point in time. We have more secular universities that are emerging uh, in the time period of the Gothic, uh, and they're just have a greater understanding of math. But what they do in these universities is they very much emphasize that math comes from God, that God is what they call the master architect or the master geometer of the universe. And that's exactly what this image is called here that we see on this page. God as the master geometer it comes right from 1220 from the middle of the Gothic. So um, because God is the author of math, when you use math in your structure, you're making it more spiritual. So some of the numbers that they use, and if you look at your study guide. One of the short essay questions is all about the mathematical proportions and numbers that were important to Gothic architecture and why, why they were significant and how was math connected to, to God, to the Christian God. So the first part we've already, or that last part we've already gone over, right? That God was seen as the author of math. He was the master geometer. He was the master architect that had laid forth all of the laws of math in the universe. And so when they started to put in mathematical ratios, that was a way to make your structures more holy. And that was something really that Sujay was emphasizing. So you'd want to start out by talking and explaining those kinds of ideas. Then you'd want to go on to explain the specific numbers and proportions that they felt like were important. So some of the common numbers that we see are three, which was the number associated with the Trinity. It was three days until Jesus was resurrected after his death. Jesus prays three times in Gethsemane. The three kings come to bring uh, Christ gifts at the nativity. Uh, the number four is also really common. It's the number usually associated with man because they have four limbs, but it's also associated with Christ because of the four points on the cross. There's the four elements of the earth, the four cardinal directions of the earth, the four seasons of the earth, uh, the four evangelists, the four gospels. Um, then there's the number seven, which is the numbers three plus four. So it carries those kind of connotations, but it also is the number of perfection. Uh, there are seven deadly sins in Catholic belief. There are seven sorrows and joys of Mary, like these events that brought her both happiness and joy that are very well known in the Catholic tradition. The number seven comes up in Revelations all the time, or there's seven seals of the apocalypse, seven angels, seven stars. Uh, there are seven days of creation, so seven is pretty common. Eight is also a symbolic number. It was the number associated with the resurrection. Um, Jesus shows himself in the Bible eight times after he was resurrected. Eight people were saved in the ark. Um, and also it's associated with Christ because somehow his Greek name references the number 888. So eight had all of those associations. And then 12 was another really common number. That's the number of Christ's apostles, the months in the year. Uh, and of course, if you do three times four, right, those other two important numbers, you get 12. Uh, and if you do 12 times 12, you get 144, which is that height of the heavenly Jerusalem, according to Revelations and to St. Augustine. So all of those numbers, three, four, seven, eight, 12, we see those used all the time in um, Gothic architecture. And we'll point out some examples. In addition to just those numbers, there's other specific numbers that come from the Bible um, and different kinds of structures in the Bible that were also used. So in the Bible, Solomon's temple is described as having a ratio of 30 to 60 cubits. So we see that ratio of one to two or 30 to 60 very often. The ark was described as being 50 cubits long. So we see 50, like 50 feet very often. And then of course, 144 that we already mentioned from Revelations as being the height of the heavenly Jerusalem. Um, so we're going to see that churches are trying to get taller and taller, right? They're using the pointed arch and the 
and the flying buttress to do so. And we'll talk about that in a minute, how that facilitates height. But um, they're able to get taller and taller as time goes on. Some of the earliest Gothic churches are, are shorter. So like Notre Dame in Paris is 108 feet tall. Uh, Chartres that we'll talk about today is 121 feet tall. Rems is 125. Then we get to Amiens. And uh, Amiens has a height of technically, in how we measure it today, 139 feet. But... Um, the way that they measured feet could be royal feet or Roman feet. So they thought it was 144 feet tall. And what's going to happen is that they're going to drive and drive and drive to get a higher, higher church, because not only were they looking for that magic number of 144, but height also began to connote like this upward focus, right? Brought your eyes heavenward, brought your focus to God. So they were trying to even go beyond that. Bouvet Cathedral gets as high as 158 feet, but that is isn't one that actually collapses. So lots of emphasis on mathematical numbers. And so when you're answering that question, you want to just kind of talk about the connection of math with God. You want to talk about how mathematic numbers had Christian significance, that Sujet was really emphasizing 144 because it was associated with heavenly Jerusalem but that there were other numbers associated with those structures in the Bible, as well as just other spiritual kinds of, of numbers that come from Christian doctrine and Bible. And then you want to specifically, you know, if it were me and I was answering this question, I probably would acknowledge that Amiens actually does get um, 144 feet. Uh, and technically, actually, uh, Bouvet is, is 144 royal feet. So Amiens is, as we measure it today, 139 feet tall, but to, uh, to the Gothic architects, it was 144 Roman feet tall. Okay. Bouvet to the way that we measure today is 158 feet tall, but to the way Gothic architects measured, it was 144 Royal feet and a Royal foot was longer than a Roman foot. So you have those two structures that hit that magic number of 144, even though when we measure them today, they don't really have 144 feet by our, by our standards. So we mentioned that one of the reasons that architects were able to do this is that they had greater mathematical know-how. They had greater understanding of engineering than the architects did in the Romanesque. One thing that we mentioned before that we need to maybe spend a little more time kind of elaborating on now is how education was really increasing during this Gothic era. And in fact, when you take the second half of this class and you talk about the Renaissance, this will be an important idea because the spread of secular education allowed for a little bit more freedom of ideas than had education that was controlled by the monasteries. And we've been talking about how the monasteries were not only political uh, centers that helped, you know, consolidate political power, but that they also were in charge of the education of the age for the most part. So as we get more and more secular universities, um, and you're looking here at a map that shows some of the secular universities in the years in which they were founded, we start to get a better mathematical understanding. Um, one thing that's really important about the math that was taught at the time was a whole movement called scholasticism. Uh, and scholasticism was, a, you know, kind of an in-depth movement. We don't need to necessarily understand everything that's going on there. But one thing was that they focused on making things that were unseen visible. So uh, they really liked to focus on trying to use scientific observation to prove God. But in fact, there's a whole book from Thomas Aquinas. It's called Summa Theologica. And one of the things he really emphasizes in that book is using Aristotelian empirical scientifically based methods to try and prove God. Okay. So they want to make things that are, that were had previously been just accepted by faith. They want to be able to kind of justify those scientifically. They want to make, uh, they want to make some sort of like visual manifestation of that. Okay. What's interesting is how that translates into Gothic architecture is that we're going to see that the structure is very apparent, right? So structure isn't hidden, but it's, um, it's very much on display uh, in Gothic structure structure. So kind of in a similitude of that whole idea of making the reasons to believe in God, something that you can prove and observe, the Gothic structure is also something that you can observe. Another thing that we see in terms of uh, referencing scholasticism within Gothic architecture is that they were all about um, making parts unite to the whole and finding um, like a rational, a rational harmonization in um in mathematics and in um 
in scholasticism, they were very much about taking a rational approach to explaining religion. And so we see that same rational approach in Gothic architecture using, you know, a rational, um, logical, repeated kind of unit of space in a very deliberate and calculated way rather than in a haphazard way. So that was something that they were already beginning to do in the Romanesque, right? We said that those were mathematically more uh, unified structures than what we'd had before, but in the Gothic, they're going to become even much more so. But all of this increase in education uh, and some of the some of the knowledge that they're getting, especially in relationship to math and engineering, is coming from contact with the Moors. And this is the time frame when they have quite a bit of area and holding in the uh, in Spain, for instance. But they're also coming into contact with the Moors through Crusades and through pilgrimage. Uh, and the Moors have just have done better at keeping some of that knowledge of engineering and math and medicine uh, and different kinds of things like that intact. And so we're in Western Europe, they were getting more exposed to some of these mathematic ideas and having a greater understanding in the Gothic because of that contact with the Moors, because those ideas then could be spread more widely in these secular universities. In fact, one of the key elements of Gothic architecture that allowed for these larger structures, taller structures to be built was the pointed arch. And if you remember, we talked about that emerging in the Romanesque, but that most historians think that that actually came through contact with the Moors. So this is one of those benefits of, uh, you know, the Western Europeans being exposed to this other culture is that they're coming, you know, becoming more knowledgeable in engineering and math and medicine. And specifically, they're even bringing back this pointed arch. So you're looking here at a diagram kind of explaining how the pointed arch works. One thing you need to understand is that um, a pointed arch is very skeletal. The structure um, is within the arch itself and the ceiling, the, the ribbed vaulting that you see up there at the, the top, the top part of that arch that's pointed, it does not need a solid vault surface to support the structure. It only needs those ribs. So what that means is that instead of having a solid vaulted arch to um to create the ceiling of the church which was incredibly heavy right all those stones coming together in a big solid long drawn out arch uh, in a vault was very very heavy and so you had to have very very heavy walls to hold up all that weight of the ceiling with a ribbed vault you can see that the structure itself just that rib doesn't weigh that much right we have just those stones that make the rib they come down and where they meet the wall you can see that the flying buttress comes up to support that meeting part because that is a place of outward thrust and then since the 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 arch and the vault is so light up there they don't need a heavy wall to support them they pretty much just need that pier that comes down straight down and the majority of the thrust in a pointed arch is not sent out where the flying buttress meets it some of the thrust is there, but the majority of the thrust is sent down all the way to the ground. So you don't have a huge amount of thrust that you have to support. You don't have a huge amount of weight from the ceiling that you have to support. And the entirety of the structure is really supported through the ribbed vaults and then the columns that come down from the ribbed vaults. That means all of the space in between the vaults all of the space in between the columns that can be opened up for other things right and because the flying buttress has been brought away from the building you can put windows right uh, in between and then you can allow all that light to come in and you've taken some of the structure a little bit farther away from the windows rather than having a buttress that just comes right up to the side of the wall and uh, takes up some of your space in that way so it's really wonderful because now the structures for how large they are are incredibly light and they're very skeletal. So the structure doesn't need a bunch of wall. It just needs the skeletal basics of the vault, the column that comes down, the flying buttress that supports the small thrust at the top, and then the majority of the thrust is sent down into the ground. So now we have this way, right, using the pointed arch and using the flying buttress, we have this way that we can build the structures that Abbot Sujay was advocating for. We can build something that's 144 feet tall. We can build something that's not only incredibly tall, but also can open up the wall space to accommodate all of those beautiful stained glass windows, let in all that Lux Nova of Abbot Sujay, uh, let in that light as a, visual, as a visual manifestation of God. Okay, So these are really important things that are kind of coming together in the Gothic, not only the engineering and the mathematical know-how, 
uh, and the funding, right, between larger cities and greater economic prosperity, but also the desire to build this kind of structure as what Abbot Sujay was advocating to create a heavenly Jerusalem. So if you look at your test study guide, you'll see that one of the other short essays is all about Abbot Sujay. What ideas integral to French Gothic architecture did he introduce? So you want to just kind of set him up as an influential political and religious leader. Talked about um, talk about how he was in a position of influence and that he was going to rebuild Saint-Denis. And we haven't talked a lot about that yet because we haven't gone to the example, but hold that thought. It's going to come into play. Um, and so when he's getting ready to do that reconstruction and remodeling of that very important church that we mentioned, right, that was a pilgrimage site, as well as a place where the French nobility and, I'm uh, sorry, the French monarchy rather, were crowned, he is looking to the ideas of who he thought was Saint-Denis, but really it was Pseudo-Dionysus the Areopagite, uh, talking about this early Christian idea of light as a visual manifestation of God. And he just built upon that, Abbot Sujet did, and he said, but it can't just be normal light, it's got to be like special light. And he said, ah, we should put it through stained glass, like that will create something that's really beautiful and special, and it will be very jewel-like, just like that text described, the heavenly Jerusalem you know, St. Augustine and the book of Revelations are talking quite a bit about the heavenly Jerusalem. <clears throat> They're talking about it being, you know, covered in jewels and paved in gold. And it's a place where heaven and earth come together. So he's really kind of advocating for those um, stained glass windows to let in all that Lux Nova is what he called it, remember? To create that jewel-like effect. He's putting in lots of golden decorations and golden um <clears throat> painted kind of articulations in the structure to create again the gold of the heavenly Jerusalem and then we just have to understand that you know he's also emphasizing certain mathematical ratios and harmonies to create the heavenly he's talking about specifically the 144 that's associated with the heavenly Jerusalem and so we see you know that many architects are trying to use the mathematical ratios and and mathematically symbolic Christian numbers as well as obtain a structure that's as high as 144 feet, really based on what Abbot Sujet was advocating. Uh, and so the use of the pointed arch, the use of the flying buttress to kind of obtain some of these goals that Sujet was, uh, was all about was really coming together to create the Gothic. So Abbot Sujet was influential for these ideas about the heavenly Jerusalem and how much those influence Gothic architecture. And he's influential then on the greater acceptance and use of the pointed arch and the flying buttress, because that was a way to obtain these kinds of goals of creating a structure that was the heavenly Jerusalem. So when we're looking here at the slide that talks about all the elements that are part of the early Gothic and architecture, this is the time period where we're going to see the beginning of those ideas start to take hold. So in terms of architectural elements, pointed arches and flying buttresses, okay, this is one of the fundamental characteristics of Gothic architecture. We've already talked about how that helped the idea of the heavenly Jerusalem, but just understand if you look at something and it's got a pointed arch, it's from the Gothic, right? It has flying buttresses, it's from the Gothic. And this allowed for the structures to be very skeletal, which meant they were very light. They could have open walls, lots of windows. They could be very tall. So height and light is something that is a direct kind of consequence of these two architectural features. So we've got a very heavy vertical emphasis in the Gothic structures. The pointed arch kind of points your eye upward. They do something called continuous colonnettes, uh, and that's really going to be the support of the ribbed arch. And we'll look at these in examples. Uh, the height, all of these things are taking your attention up to heaven, taking your attention up to God. They're trying to capture a structure that will be the heavenly Jerusalem, right? They're trying to do Lux Nova, that beautiful filtered divine light coming through stained glass. They're trying to create that effect of the jewels of the heavenly Jerusalem. They're trying to use like gilding and gold decorations to remind you of the golden streets of the heavenly Jerusalem. They're trying to get to that height of 144. Those are all things that we're seeing as emphases to try and create that sense of the heavenly Jerusalem. Space is more rational and mathematic. We've already kind of introduced that idea. It's more consistent and unified. We talked about how that was related to the scholasticism of the time, as well as that the architecture is manifest, right? You can see the structure. It's not hidden behind something else. Those two ideas really come from the scholasticism of the age. Uh, mathematical ratios and numbers, the Christian's uh, significance behind those were also very important. 3, 4, 7, 8, 12, 30, 50, 60, and 144. Uh, what we're going to see in the interiors of these Gothic structures is that we're going to move in the early period to a four-part nave elevation. So remember in the Romanesque, they had three. 
they had the arcade, they had the gallery, they had the Clara story. They're going to add one above the gallery, but below the Clara story. It's called the Triforium. Uh, and the Clara story is going to get taller and taller and taller and let in more and more light as time goes on. Now, what's going to happen in the high is they're going to get rid of that Triforium because they feel like, you know, that's too much horizontal divisions of space, right? To have all those elevations. And if we do only three, it had a greater vertical emphasis. So they're eventually going to get rid of that Triforium. But um, we're going to see a lot of stained glass windows with tracery. So tracery is like stone supports that go through the windows. Um, and we're going to see a lot of them in lancet shapes, which is just like a pointed arch shape. And we're going to see that the rose window becomes really popular. And we'll talk about that as well. So ribbed vaulting, of course, is a key element that that goes along with the pointed arches and flying buttresses in between those ribs they fill in the ceiling with really light materials. They call it webbing, actually. Usually it's like brick um, or something that's very light, much lighter than stone, so that the ceiling on the whole, the entire vault, is very light. It's supported just by the ribs, and then that thrust is sent down the columns to the ground. Okay, and those are those continuous colonnettes, and sometimes they cluster them together, clustered piers. We'll see examples of this too. Um, those are all things that are just normal elements in Gothic architecture. Now on the exterior, we're going to see again, rational and tripartite facades. We're going to see pointed arches. We're going to see flying buttresses. We're going to see a lot of uh, things that draw our attention heavenward. Uh, and we're going to see with the floor plans. Now we've got usually a bigger apse area. It's called the chevet or a choir. We talked about that briefly last week. We'll see some examples today. They're going to have the ambulatory, which was that new invention of the Romanesque, right? To accommodate pilgrims. And sometimes in the Gothic, they'll do a double ambulatory because they want to have lots of pilgrims come in and they'll have radiating chapels like they did in the Romanesque. But what happens often in the Gothic is that those are unified. So you could walk from one chapel to another rather than going out of the chapel into the ambulatory and back into the next chapel. So this too unifies the space and accommodates pilgrims and all of those relics. Okay, these were structures that had a lot of decoration um, and as the Gothic goes on, it's going to get more and more decorative. So different from the Romanesque where decoration, especially in the exterior, was limited. We're going to see much more decoration in the Gothic and they're, of course, going to be painted usually. Uh, and of course, they're painted on the inside as well as the outside. And these are all meant to just teach people, right? The the stories of the Bible, the, the concepts of, of good Christians and so on. When it comes to sculpture, we're going to see that there are some things that will really remind us of the Romanesque, but it's usually not quite as simplified, quite as abstracted, or quite as elongated, but some of those still things are still continuing on. So generic figures, S-curving figures, elongation, stylization, simplification, unbelievable pose, uh, poses with toy, toes that are pointed down, or um, incorrect proportions, continuous narrative, those are things that all continue in the Gothic, but what we really have to realize and how the Gothic architecture begins to separate itself, or sorry, not architecture, but sculpture begins to separate itself from the Romanesque is that we start to see these uh, sculptures showing greater humanization and greater believability. And so we're kind of in this transition period, right? That's moving us towards the Renaissance when things become very believable in terms of showing the body. So we start to see more humanization in these Gothic sculptures sometimes, better poses, better proportions, a much more naturalistic feel of a bulky body that actually has the form of a body, faces that look more specific rather than so generic, um, drapery that looks less stylized but looks more believable. Sometimes we even see figures that look a little bit classical to us. Now going along with that, that means that a lot of these figures in the Gothic are less architectonic than the Romanesque. Uh, we have, you know, so many times in uh, the Romanesque where we see sculptures that you just can't separate them from the structure that's behind them, right? They're very unified with the structure. They're very architectonic. In the Gothic, we're going to see that that really begins to change and figures feel much more independent. Um, we have a lot more decoration on the exterior of these Gothic structures than what we had in the Romanesque. Because remember in the Romanesque, it was usually just around the portal. In the Gothic... A lot of it's going to be painted, the, or, or sorry, the sculpture on the outside of the church. And we didn't make a big enough deal about that last week, but that's true of the Romanesque as well. So it's way to kind of decorate the church. So a lot of them were painted. Um, one thing that's going to be kind of new in the Gothic is we're going to get um, some works that really emphasize grace and elegance and beauty, um, S-curving sways with elongated kinds of figures. That will be a part of the Gothic as well.
Um, the sculpture of the Gothic is really that first medium to embrace that greater naturalism. We will see some examples towards the end of the Gothic and manuscript illumination start to embrace it as well, uh, but sculpture is the first. Okay, in manuscript illumination, which is very similar to stained glass, so we've put them together here, we get lots of linear effects in the figures. They seem pretty simplified, pretty generic and flat. Uh, lots of frontal poses, lots of S-curving, swaying figures. Um, the grace and the elegance is something that we see quite a bit in manuscript illumination and stained glass here. Space doesn't seem very three-dimensional. Uh, things seem pretty flat, but the figures seem pretty flat within the space as well. Lots of continuous narrative to make the story really apparent. Horror vacui continues. The linear effects, right, especially around those decorative borders that we've had all the way um, that kind of come back from the migration period and the interlace, that's going to continue in the Gothic as well. So when you look at the test, uh, the test is asking for you, the long essay, to talk about how uh, three-dimensional sculpture in figural representations, right? So sculpture of the human form, how that's different in the Romanesque and the Gothic. So you can see that there's a lot of stuff that is similar, right, to those two eras. There's things that the Gothic does the same. But what's important to really point out is that the Gothic is in sculpture starting to move to greater naturalism, right? More humanism with specific faces and emotions, better um, representations of the body that look more believable. The, the figures are less architectonic and they have better poses. We'll even see some that have contrapposto. Right? The figures seem bulkier. Their toes are foreshortened instead of pointing down. Some of the figures even look really classical. Uh, and of course, there's just way more figures than what we had in the Romanesque and things uh, sometimes are much more elegant and graceful. So it's important when you're answering that question that you acknowledge that a lot of what happens in the Gothic is very similar to the Romanesque in sculpture, but that, that there is this kind of new direction that's emerging in the Gothic that's leading us up to the naturalism of the Romanesque. Uh, the other thing that we'll talk about and that needs to be addressed in the question is to talk about how the messages in the Romanesque differ from the messages of sculpture in the Gothic. Remember in the Romanesque, we talked a lot about the last judgment scenes and um, how it was all about scaring people to repent and scaring people into obeying the Catholic Church. Uh, in the Gothic, it really is more of like a positive reinforcement kind of situation. Uh, a lot of times they're trying to encourage people to, you know, obey the Catholic Church and partake in these Catholic rites and rituals because that will give them salvation, right? So instead of threatening them with damnation if they don't, they promise them salvation if they do. Uh, because salvation is so in, so emphasized in the Gothic, we do see a lot of um, interest in Mary because Mary, remember, is a major intercessor. She's this mother figure that wants to make sure everyone is taken care of and everyone obtains their salvation and she'll intercede at your last judgment and plead on your behalf. So we see quite a bit of um, Mary as a topic. We're also going to see some typology where the Old Testament and the New Testament are connected. So um, St. Augustine talked about how the New Testament lay, lay hidden in the Old Testament and that the Old Testament was fulfilled in the New Testament. So this was a long-standing Catholic idea that there's continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so a lot of times we'll see a juxtaposition of Old Testament stories and they're meant to be prototypes of what happens in the New Testament. Like something that just comes to mind off the top of my head is Jonah. He was in the whale, uh, swallowed up for three days, and then he was spit out, right? He's a prototype for what happens in the New Testament where Christ is uh, is killed and is in the tomb for three days and then reemerges, okay? So we'll start off now by looking at some examples from the early Gothic period. Okay, so this is roughly, you know, a 50 year period or so, depending on where you are in Europe, but it begins in France, as we said, and it begins with Abbot Sujet and his Saint Denis, and that will actually be our first example. So just as always, right, there's a transition from one style to the next. So this is a time when we see a, quite a few Romanesque elements keeping present in the works, but we're starting to see Gothic elements emerge and be combined with those. And as time goes on, we'll see more and more Gothic elements and fewer and fewer Romanesque elements. So things usually look still pretty heavy at this stage. We don't have as much uh, sculpture on the outside of the church, just kind of reminding us of the Romanesque. Things aren't as tall, right, because they are just trying to figure out, you know, their engineering and really figure out how tall they can make the structures. Uh, but we are starting to see greater mathematical unity and um, greater mathematical precision in these structures versus the Romanesque. And the space inside the churches isn't as divided, 
uh, in Romanesque, we get like a, a radiating chapel, for instance, right? It's its own little space, but we start to see in the Gothic places where they try to keep space all together in one unified whole. So we're starting to see the beginnings of that. So here is that exterior um, of that abbot church, or sorry, Abbey Church of Saint Denis, uh, who is the patron saint of France. This is the one that Abbot Suget oversees the remodeling of. Um, so this facade is mostly Romanesque in its nature, uh, and Abbot Suget doesn't have a ton of of um, changes that are instituted in the facade because this is a remodeling of a church right remember there was a church that had been here for a long time and had been through a few different kinds of uh, phases of remodeling already by the time we get to Abbot Suget so when we look at the facade we see things that are mostly Romanesque in nature uh, we have that tripartite and rational facade that's something that we have in the Romanesque as well as the Gothic we don't have very much sculpture it's just pretty much around the doorways um, but we do have the rounded Romanesque arches still going right those are all all Romanesque elements. The windows aren't very large, although they're larger than some of the other examples that we've seen. We have buttresses, uh, and if you're looking at this and wondering what happened to the tower, uh, it was a little bit taller than the other. Uh, it wasn't actually completed during Suje's lifetime, and it was struck by lightning and not very long after his lifetime, and then it had to be rebuilt. And then it was rebuilt again in like the 19th century, but uh, something went wrong with that. It had to be taken down, so it's just has just the one. So lots of Romanesque elements going on here, um, but there is one Gothic element. There is one thing that really gives us a heads up that we're moving into the Gothic, and that's that rose window that we see above the central doorway. So that rounded window that looks kind of like a flower, that's a rose window. The rose window was associated with Mary, who was the rose. Right? She was often talked about as the rose without thorns. Uh, so that was a specific reference to Mary. Remember, Mary's very important in the Gothic. So there's, uh, there's that as a Gothic element. Now remember, this is the church um, where the French royalty were buried. This is the church that had the relics of Saint Denis. So the cult of saints and pilgrimage were very important to this place. And uh, not only did we have lots of people coming here on pilgrimage, but we had a lot of people coming to see um, French funerals for the monarchy or to see just the tombs of the French monarchy. So uh, when he's writing this book of Suget and talking about all these great ideas he wants to do in architecture like Lux Nova and stained glass and the heavenly Jerusalem and divine light and uh, the golden kind of touches and mathematical proportions and the number 144, like when he's doing all of that, what he does is he he starts um, and he does the, the apps later right so he's the, the holiest part of the church comes comes a little bit later so that it's a little less um controversial for people because the whole fact that he wanted to remodel things was a little bit controversial so when we look at the floor plan here you can see the romanesque example of uh, santa foi over there on the left on the bottom and how that compares to this new gothic approach to unified space that we see in the redoing of Saint Denis. Now, uh, the reason it was controversial for this church to be redone was that it was a really special location in the hearts of many French people because of the French royalty being buried there and because of the relics of Saint Denis. Uh, Saint Denis was martyred. He was an early Christian martyr. He was martyred in Paris, which is about five miles away, uh, and he was beheaded somehow. Uh, he picked up his head and walked with it all the way out here to the site at Saint Denis and that was like the sign that people needed to understand that he wanted a church built in that location. So when we look at this floor plan, you can see, of course, the apse, and you can see around that, there's a little detail on the right of what the apse looks like. And you can see that this apse has been enlarged and that it's become kind of a little more elaborate. So usually the word that we use here to describe it is the chevet or sometimes the choir. And then the apse is still a term that we use to talk about just that little semicircular spot that's still central in the chevet, but not the entirety of the whole structure. So surrounding the apse, we have the ambulatory, and then we have unified radiating chapels. So you can see the radiating chapels all come off, but they don't have walls in between them. They're not separated. So in effect, it becomes like a double ambulatory because you could walk 
between the chapels from one chapel to another, in addition to being able to walk out in the ambulatory space. So that's really a wonderful thing for the pilgrims who want to come here and see the relics, um, to see the, the buried French monarchs. And that's something that we see, that unified space is something that we see more often in the Gothic. Uh, some other things that we see here that tell us that this is the Gothic is the greater kind of mathematical consistency. So if you look at the floor plan, the repeated units of space are more uniform than what they were in um, in the Romanesque. And there are still some spaces that aren't quite exactly, um, you know, wonderful, but definitely making some strides in becoming more, more accurate in terms of repeated mathematical units. And then one of the biggest things that we see is the use of mathematic kinds of symbolism in in the different aspects of the floor plan so you know we talked about those numbers three four seven and twelve and how those are important and if you look you're going to see those numbers used over and over for instance as a three-part kind of division you side aisle nave side aisle just kind of an obvious one there uh, and then we have if you look at the bays which would be the horizontal kind of divisions of space there are 12 bays, including the apse. Uh, and if you look at the radiating chapels, there are seven of those radiating chapels. So you can see that those um, numbers that were very important were used over and over uh, in, in these mathematical kinds of ways to suggest these Christian meanings. Here you're looking at an image of that chevet area. So you, the apse is off to the left of this image and you are as though you're getting ready to walk into the ambulatory there in the center or the radiating chapels that are unified over there on the right. So you can see how open it is and how unified it is in a Gothic structure. And that would have been something that was very different from the Romanesque structures because space would have been more segmented and separated. This is a great image because it shows you one of the major benefits of the pointed arch. We've already talked quite a bit about the pointed arch is a skeletal structure and it doesn't need as much stone to support it on the whole as the Romanesque did because the entirety of the structure is supported by those ribs that you're seeing up there. You can see all the ribs in the vault and that the ribs send the weight downward and then you can fill in that area between the ribs with something very lightweight. We talked quite a bit about how wonderful that is because it means you can open up the walls for big windows and you can create much larger and taller structures because they aren't as heavy. One of the things that we haven't talked about yet that is also wonderful about the arch is that these pointed arches could have the same height but they could still span different distances. So when we look at the top of the image, you can see some more narrow openings. Those are the same height. And then how those <clears throat> widen up uh, as they move into the radiating chapels. This makes um, a lot of possibilities uh, available in Gothic architecture that definitely were not a possibility with the rounded Roman arch. In the Romanesque, when they're using that rounded Roman arch, you have to have a certain ratio of height to width. You cannot manipulate that. The height and width are always the same ratio, but in a pointed arch, you can manipulate that. You can have different widths for the same height. So it's a really wonderful technique and it allows them to create then these unified types of spaces. As we look down into the Chevet area, so this image is taken from the point of view that you are kind of in the transept crossing area. And of course, obviously you're up high on the second level. So we're looking down into the apse right there in the center. And then we're looking into the ambulatory and the walkways around them. Uh, and you can see how wonderful uh, it is to have huge, large, amazingly beautiful stained glass windows. And that's really pop possible now because of the skeletal structure of the Gothic. Uh, we have the Clara story at the top and you can see that it's much taller than it was in the Romanesque. So that lets a ton of light just flood into the interior. And remember, this is light that's coming through that beautiful stained glass. This is the Lux Nova that Abbot Sujet wanted. He wanted that to create a sense of a heavenly Jerusalem. A lot of times the original interior paint in these gothic structures had quite a bit of gold and gilding a lot of times in the ceiling and especially along the ribs there was quite a bit of gilding 
So the stained glass and the Lux Nova coming through that and the jewel effect of that would have, been, would have been combined with the golden effects and really brought to mind the heavenly Jerusalem and the part of the viewer. Okay, now this specific nave interior does not reach the height of 144, the height of the heavenly Jerusalem that Abbot Suger was really... Uh, campaigning for but nonetheless we do have a lot of upward thrust and a lot of vertical focus so we have that pointed arch that brings your eye heavenward right and that's repeated over and over in the nave arcade that bottom level uh, and this one has just a three-part nave elevation so we've got the nave arcade then we have the gallery and then we have the clerestory the repeated um pointed arch there is continually drawing your eye upward the narrow kind of narrowness of the nave in comparison to the height of the nave also brings your eye upward. So all of that is heavenly focus. And that was something that was spiritually enhancing to a lot of people as they entered into this space. Okay, now we talked already about how the space is more unified. Uh, the repeated units of geometric kind of units that they use to lay out the structure uh, creates a sense of harmony and unity. Also, there's more connection of one space to another, so things are much more spaced. But the other thing that this image shows that we haven't necessarily seen an example of yet are what we call continuous colonnettes. So if you look um, right on the left corner of the image, or the left side rather, of the image, you can see that there's a bunch of small columns that come together, and they're bundled together. They come um, from each transverse rib, right, as the ribs come across in the arch and come back down towards the wall, then there is a column that supports each of those ribs. So individually, those are called continuous colonnettes. If you watch and go from where they join the ribs, the transverse ribs, and go all the way down to the ground, you can see that there are not any kinds of interruptions, no kinds of horizontal <laughs> distractions from that verticality. So that's why they're called continuous colonnettes. And they're called colonnettes because they're small. And then they're often referred to as well as cluster or compound piers because you have all of those columns clustered together. So individually, each of them is called a continuous colonnette. And they you know, continuously go all the way from the floor of the nave up to the springing. That's what you call that moment where they join with the transverse rib, the springing of the rib of the vault. So it's continuous. Uh, but then when you put them together and they form one big team that is a cluster pier or a compound pier. This image is taken as though you've just walked into the doors of the church and you're looking down the nave. Down at the end you're seeing that apse chevet area. Okay, So this is just a really beautiful example of how unified the space is and how harmonious everything seems together as you enter into this cathedral. Right away you can notice the gothic pointed arches the ribbed vaulting that those create, and we'll see an image just of the ceiling in a moment. Uh, these each have a bay division. Um, this is kind of hard to describe without a laser pointer, but if you look at each pier, right, as they go down the nave arcade, and you follow those continuous colonnettes up, you'll see that one of the ribs goes straight across. Okay, and then the other ribs crisscross and create an X shape. And then one rib goes straight across the nave ceiling, and then as we were moving towards the apse, uh, we get another crisscross pair. Then we get one that goes all the way across, another crisscross pair. Every um, division of space that those ones that go straight across create is called a bay. So essentially each X shape is taking up, is consuming a bay, right? So there's one bay, two bay, three bays. And then we can see the crossing, right, of the transept in the nave. So it's wider than the others. Uh, when there's four divisions of space in a bay like that, that's called quadripartite vaulting. And I think that we had a chance to talk about that last week when we were looking at St. Etienne. Um, St. Etienne, sorry. You know my French is horrible. Uh, so this is quadripartite vaulting. It becomes very common in the Gothic. Uh, and of course, you can see the continuous colonnettes there on the front of the cluster piers. Some of them are continuous. And then you can see some of them are just bracing up the nave arcade. Those continuous colonnettes bringing the vertical focus along with the pointed arches. Uh, the stained glass and all the light coming through the stained glass, all of the original kind of decoration here that would have been very heavily emphasizing gold was meant to bring to mind the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, the height here, as we said, is not quite as tall. This one here is about 100 feet tall, it's 30 meters, 30 meters. But remember, the number 30 was actually a significant number. Uh, it was one of the measurements of Solomon's temple, right? So the number 30 is an important 
kind of mathematically symbolic number that we're seeing uh, in the construction of this work, in addition to some of the other ones that we've already talked about with the floor plan. I love this image because the lighting conditions are perfect to capture just how amazing stained glass can be. The colors that come through it can be incredibly vibrant. Uh, sometimes when you go and the day is really warm and the sun is really bright, it kind of washes the colors out a little bit too much. But here you can see them really coming through with all their richness, uh, giving us a good sense of what it would have been like you know, to enter into these cathedrals. Not only would normal everyday people just be blown away by the scale, but also the decoration and then all this beautiful light filtering through the glass. This would have been a really amazing experience, a very unique experience for people and would have created that sense of you're entering into something that's separate from every day. You're entering into something that's closer to heaven, right? You're becoming uh, a part of that heavenly Jerusalem. And that's exactly what Abbot Sujet wanted to have. In this image, you can also see how there's some stone supports in the window. So each of these is a pointed arch window. So we call that a lancet. You can see that the top of the lancet has a rose window and then there's two smaller divisions of two smaller pointed arches within the entirety of the of the window so the stone divisions are the tracery and that just helps to support the structure when you have such huge panels of glass our next example is Chartres Cathedral. This one is an amazing example of Gothic architecture in almost every way except the facade. So we'll talk about it uh, and how it's very Romanesque on the facade in a moment, but the story behind it is that it had been rebuilt in the early part of the 12th century and then there was a fire. And um, the facade survived, right? So as it had been rebuilt, that facade survives the fire, but the rest of the structure has to be rebuilt. And it's rebuilt very quickly in like 25 years, which is amazing for a Gothic cathedral like this. Usually they would take decades or even hundreds of years to be completed. Because it was completed so quickly, everything's pretty unified in terms of the style here, just accepting that facade. This was a place that was a very important uh, center of learning. They had a cathedral school there, so a kind of a university run by the church. It was a pilgrimage location, um, and in fact, one of their most important relics, it was a relic of the garment of Mary, right, the Virgin Mary. It survived the fire because it was in the crypt, so it was kind of this miraculous thing that happened um, in the course of that tragedy of the fire. So a lot of people were coming here for university studies, a lot of people were coming here for pilgrim pilgrimage. Uh, and so this was a really important church and helped to disseminate the Gothic style. Uh, of course, the town of Chartres was very proud of their church. And remember, we talked about how uh, churches or towns rather really began to compete with each other. Who could have the most impressive church and attract the most pilgrims? Who could have the best relics and get the most tourists to come uh, to their towns and see that? So when we look here at the Romanesque elements, you have kind of a combination on the front. Uh, first of all, the towers are done a little bit later, especially that left tower. So you can kind of discount those. Um, when we look at the facade, we do see a big rose window, and that's for sure a Gothic element. Uh, we do have larger windows than what we saw in the Romanesque, but we don't have a ton of space opened up by the window. So that's a little bit Romanesque and a little bit Gothic. But we do still have some elements that clearly remind us of the Romanesque. We got a lot of expanses of stone, right? And all that heavy stonework is really characteristic of the Romanesque. We have rounded Roman arches, so that's another thing. And we do have sculpture here, but on the facade, it's just limited to the portals. Okay, so in the Romanesque, that's pretty much the only spot where the, the sculpture was. Uh, and we're going to see, though, that the rest of the structure really does have quite a bit more decoration. And remember that the early Gothic structures have more decoration than the Romanesque on the exterior. And then as the Gothic goes on and on, they just get more and more and more decorative. And that'd be a really important point that you'd want to bring out on your essay about figural sculpture in the Romanesque versus the Gothic. One of the reasons that this is a great example to show you is that when we spend a little time looking at the facade, we can also kind of elaborate on the sculpture that we saw that was part of the Romanesque. Because really, uh, even though this facade dates from the very earliest moments of the Gothic, the Gothic hasn't totally caught on. And uh, the sculpture that's done here is really done in a Romanesque style. So that's going to give us an opportunity to kind of remind ourselves of some of the things we saw last week in terms of Romanesque style in 3D sculpture uh, and help us understand how Gothic sculpture started to differentiate itself. So you're looking here at the three doorways 
they love to do those three because again that number three has the spiritual significance uh, and they've got decorations around each so they have decorations in the tympanum area right that semicircular area right above the door and then they also have some jam figures right the the, um, the wall that surrounds the doorway the door jams uh, these ones are this is actually called the royal portals so what we have here are we have um, Old Testament kings and queens shown in contemporary clothing um, as, as though they're contemporary kings and queens of France. So the idea here is that the Old Testament kings are like the royal lineage for Christ and that's a predecessor to the kings and queens of France. We won't spend a ton of time looking at the tympanum areas. We're actually going to spend a little more time looking at the jam figures. But here, this is above uh, the doorway, and it has the virgin and child enthroned. So we just have to remember the importance of Mary as an intercessor, Mary as a tool to help you obtain salvation. So many of those Gothic sculptures have a more positive kind of message of the blessings of salvation. And don't you want to be obedient and do all the Catholic um, requirements so that you could obtain salvation, right? Mary will help you out. That's kind of the message here. The archivolts surrounding the tympanum are pretty fascinating because they show all the liberal arts being practiced. Uh, we have to just remember that Chartres was that university, right? That church school, and it's called the cathedral school. And this was just a way to essentially acknowledge that all knowledge comes from Christ. This is another one of the tympanum, and this is a uh, from the central door and essentially we have Christ in majesty at the second coming. Uh, so he's surrounded by the four symbols of the evangelist, the winged man, uh, the ox, the lion, and the eagle, right? So John is the eagle, Luke is the ox, Matthew is the winged man, and Mark is the lion. Uh, even though we're just going to spend a brief moment here, I just want to kind of remind you of things that we see in the Romanesque. There's a sense of horror vacui that's very common in the sculpture. Uh, there is a very uh, strong sense of flatness, and that's common in the Romanesque as well. Not only is there a flat sense of space, but the figures themselves seem pretty flat and not very volumetric. There's some stylization going on, especially in the robe of Christ. His toes are pointed downwards. The faces on the figures are generic rather than feeling like they're individualized. Um, the proportions are usually elongated and things are inconsistent in terms of making things look um, as though they match, like the proportions of hands and heads to bodies and so on, things like that. There's a sense of horror vacui. There's not a lot of empty space here. Uh, we do have S-curving figures, a lot of frontal types of poses. Uh, and then we have the beautiful outer archivolt that has those organic kinds of patterns and interlacing lines. And that's all things that we would associate with the Romanesque. Remember, in the Romanesque and the Gothic, most of the sculpture was originally painted. And that's true here as well, uh, although the paint has worn away. Here you can see the detail a little bit more clearly uh, and see some of the elements of Romanesque sculpture that we've already outlined in the previous slide. Uh, one thing though that's really common in the Gothic that we see is the sense of typology that we have here. So the um, sense that the Old Testament kings and prophets that are shown underneath the sculpture flanking the doorways, they are the basis for then the New Testament apostles and Christ that are shown up here above. So that correlation between the Old Testament saying that it is a foundation for what comes in the New Testament, that is definitely something that is common in Gothic in terms of messages of sculpture. Uh, you can see when we look at Christ, even though a lot of bodies feel pretty flat, um, we do have a little sense of foreshortening here, right? With his uh, knees kind of coming out toward us, even though his toes are pointed down a little bit still. Uh, there is a little bit more capability in showing a body that's a bit more naturalistic. So a little bit of transition going on here, but for the most part, still looking very Romanesque. Okay, so now we're where we want to kind of focus for a second. These are the jam figures. So these are the figures that are standing next to the doorway. And in fact, in this image, you can see that door a little bit on the left. So uh, these jam figures are very Romanesque in nature. First of all, they are incredibly architectonic. Remember we said that in the Romanesque, it felt like the sculptures mimicked the architecture behind them, right? We're definitely seeing that these figures look like columns. Uh, they have generic faces. We can't really... Um, see any sort of individual individuality within them. Their drapery is stylized uh, and their proportions are really inaccurate and elongated. I mean, look at the female figure. 
and how much longer she is than everyone else, even though her waist kind of matches up with everyone, uh, other than the figure on the right, her legs are super long. Okay, so those inconsistent proportions, we've got a lot of decorative effects. If you look at those little colonnettes in between the figures, they're so beautifully carved with organic kinds of interlacing forms, geometric types of patterns. Uh, and those are things that are very dominant in the Romanesque and they do continue into the Gothic, usually in those border areas. This image shows here the stylization a little bit more clearly and how generic those faces are, uh, as well as the inconsistencies and in proportions, right? If you're looking at the hands and the heads uh, in comparison to the body, those things aren't really very accurate. And that's definitely a part of what we see in the Romanesque in terms of of style. These figures are also very abstracted, which is another key characteristic of the Romanesque, right? We're not getting tons of details, not getting a real feeling of a volumetric body, but instead the bodies seem pretty flat. Uh, they don't seem very convincing in that way. Uh, and even though this is, you know, a series of sculptures on their columns, I would say that we do even still feel that sense of horror vacui here just because of all of the decorative elements on those continuous colonnettes between them. There's not a lot of empty space. So remember this, um, this and other sculptures, both in the Romanesque and the Gothic, they were meant to be religious stories. They were meant to be teaching tools, right? Didactic, that term that we use. Uh, and in both the Romanesque and Gothic, they were usually painted. So lots of things in, in common with these two periods in terms of their use and uh, the way that they were painted. But we do see different treatments in the figures as we start to move into the Gothic, as well as the subject matter. And our next slide is going to show that. This slide is an image of the north porch on the same church. Okay, so there's doors on um, the west, the north, and the south sides. So these are the ones that are next to the doors on the north side. It's often called the porch of the confessors. Now, if you're looking at this and you're thinking how different that looks from the royal portal, you're right, because the royal portal was essentially still done in the Romanesque period, though at the very tail end. And now this is done about 1220. Okay, so this is really as the Gothic has, has begun and the rest of the structure, as we said, at Chartres in the Cathedral, which we'll talk about in a, mo in a moment, really does have quite a few Gothic characteristics. So we're starting to see some differences in the way figures are treated. First of all, this is much more naturalistic than what we saw in, in the Romanesque. Instead of having such strict frontality, the figures are kind of varying a little bit in their poses, turning one way, turning the other. Uh, their faces are more individualized. Their proportions are more accurate, accurate and less elongated. The bodies are more volumetric, right? So we get a sense, a more convincing sense rather that there's actually a bulky body underneath that drapery rather than just kind of a flat flatness like we saw in some of our other examples. Uh, we definitely have better drapery shown here, especially the example I think on the far right, that's much more convincing looking almost classical in some ways. So this greater sense of humanization is something that we associate with many sculptures in the Gothic. We really start to see them giving uh, better proportions to the human body, more accurate renditions of the human body, more individualized faces, and sometimes we'll even see human emotion and relationship, although that's not quite come into plan yet at this point. This is the South Porch. Okay, so on the opposite side, and this one's called the Porch of the Martyrs. Uh, it's done just a few years after the other porch. So as the other porch is getting finished up, this one's kind of being completed. Uh, and this shows, I think, even greater sense of humanism and naturalism in comparison to the last example. And both of these, right, the, both the North and the South Porch are way more naturalistic than that more Romanesque facade where we saw the royal portals. Much more volume to these bodies. Um, the toes come out toward us rather than being pointed down quite so much. Um, the drapery seems to convey the sense that there's a bulky body underneath it and the drapery has really um, let all that stylization go and created something that's much more naturalistic and believable. We don't have such strict frontality anymore, but the figures kind of twist and turn and give us more believable sense of human bodies. And in fact, if we look at the figure all the way on the left, this one's St. Theodore, there's even kind of a, a sense of contrapposto going on there. It is not true contrapposto, but there's hints, right? This artist is thinking about how we stand and trying to create something that looks more believable there. And he's almost caught a sense of contrapposto there uh, in that rendition of St. Theodore. Here we can see St. Theodore um, a little closer up. 
and you can see how naturalistic he looks. His face is very humanistic, uh, conveys a sense of, of life, a sense of individualization. He's much less architectonic than those royal portals, and he feels almost fully separated from the architecture behind him. Uh, he's less frontal in his pose, and we already talked about the contrapposto, the more believable drapery, the greater sense of proportions, all sorts of things. Um, here we have him portrayed in contemporary clothing, and he's kind of conveying that idea of an ideal Christian knight, um, which is very popular in the Gothic. Louis the Ninth, the King of France, um, he was Louis the Pious. He was all about this, right? Being a, being a good Christian and being like a good knight at the same time. Um, and so we have his St. Theodore here shown in contemporary clothing with contemporary kind of weaponry as a way to allude to that idea. So these Gothic instances of naturalism are really important and crucial for us to see. The Renaissance doesn't come out of nowhere. And yes, the Renaissance is definitely heavily indebted to that resurgence of classical style, that resurgence of classical philosophy. But we already had trends leaning towards greater naturalism in the Gothic before that. Okay, this image now, we've moved to the interior of the church to see some of the stained glass windows. These stained glass windows were donated by the guilds of the town. We have to remember the guilds were these kind of um, organizations that oversaw the training of certain professions and also protected the goods that were produced and the artisans working in that trade. They became very powerful both economically and politically in this time period. So over 150 stained glass windows were donated by the guilds. 43 of those originals survive. Um, then there was additional 44 windows that were donated by nobles and clerics. So you can see that those middle-class guildsmen and businessmen were really donating quite heavily to the church. And that was in their interest, right? More pilgrims will want to come. We'll have more income from tourism. If you took all of this glass out at Chartres Cathedral and laid it down, you would have seven acres worth of stained glass. And much of it um, really does survive intact. So there's no plain glass here. They removed it in the Hundred Years War. They removed it during the Huguenot um, troubles. They removed it during the French Revolution, World War I, World War II. They take it out at all those time periods to protect it. And so we still have this wonderful legacy today. Uh, there's some typology in the windows. What we have is we have on the north side, the Old Testament stories, and those would have been the ones that didn't get very much light, right? On the north. Then the ones on the south side were the New Testament stories. So this kind of connection between the two saying that the Old Testament was a time of greater darkness when they didn't have the fulfillment of the gospel. The North Testament is um, a time of greater lightness and full knowledge of the gospel. This window here is a detail from the window of the Carpenters Guild. And you can see that they've pictured themselves. Uh, they're working on their carpentry uh, underneath different types of Bible stories. And that's what many of the guilds did in these windows. Uh, you can see the beautiful kinds of rich luminescent colors coming through the glass, creating that jewel-like effect uh, and really reminding us of Lux Nova. One window is called the Good Samaritan window. Uh, it is a good example of how we have typology happening in the Gothic period. It's also a good example of how many of the subjects of the Gothic in art, sculpture, windows, manuscript illumination, many of those subjects focus on the capability of people to obtain salvation. Uh, and it also is a good example of some of the style that we see in stained glass that really parallels the style of the manuscripts. So here's a detail. What we're seeing is we're seeing the um, story of the fall of Adam and Eve. And in this window, it's paralleled with the story of the Good Samaritan. So it's typology, right? In the Bible, man fell, man became fallen, right? In the New Testimony, uh, or sorry, in the New Testament, the same sort of idea is conveyed through um, man as fallen and then Christ, you know, the Good Samaritan who, oh, not the Good Samaritan, sorry, but the um, the man who falls by the wayside and is robbed and hurt, he's the one who's fallen. And then Christ is symbolized by the Good Samaritan in that story. And he comes in and offers, um, you know, healing and help to this figure who's fallen by the wayside, uh, just as he helps those who have fallen spiritually and need help. So it's this kind of continuity of the stories that happen in the Old Testament have similar patterns to the stories that happen in the New Testament. Uh, the things that happen in the New Testament are a fulfillment of the things that were hinted at in the Old Testament. So that's typology, essentially. Uh, the style here you can see is really a great example of what we have in the Gothic. 
Uh, we get a lot of elongation in the figures. We get S curving type of the figure, stylization in the drapery, flatness in the figures and in the space. We even do have a sense of a little bit of horror vacui here, although it's not as strong as it can be. Um, there's a lot of frontal types of poses, although this has maybe a little more variation than other other examples but there's a lot of like curving organic kinds of lines and s curving types of figures and that is something in the gothic that becomes increasingly associated with elegance and opulence and nobility and they really like to kind of focus on that down at the bottom of this window, you can see the shoe cobblers hard at work. They were the patrons of the Good Samaritan window. Um, I love that. I think that that's totally an appropriate story for them to choose because people that go on pilgrimage and Chartres, uh, Chartres was on that pilgrimage route, they run out of shoes and they need their shoes fixed. And so those shoe cobblers were probably keeping really busy with the pilgrims that were coming not only to Chartres Cathedral to see the relics of the Virgin Mary, but those who were just visiting on their way to um, greater sites in Santiago de Compostela. This is the rose window and the lancet windows underneath it. This is the one that you can see through the facade. So this is really large. It's 42 feet in diameter. Uh, so it's kind of the width of the entire nave. Um, and of course the rose window was meant to symbolize Mary. This was given by Blanche of Castile. There's a lot of references to her in the subject matter. And we don't necessarily need to take a lot of time to look at this, but I do just want to show you how uh, some references to numeric symbolism happened even in the stained glass windows. So here, now that you're looking at the rose window, you can see it's divided into kind of 12 segments. And of course we know three times four is 12 and 12 times 12 is 144. 12 is the number of the months of the year, uh, 12 apostles, all those different kinds of references. And of course three and four and all the different references they've had. We've already gone over those at the beginning of the lecture. So I won't take a ton of time to rehash those all here, but remember three most importantly is associated with the Trinity, the days to the resurrection, four, to man, right? Man has four humors, man has four limbs, uh, four seasons, um, all sorts of different references there to four. Um, and then of course, three plus seven is, or sorry, three plus four is seven, the number of perfection, the number of sorrows, the number of um, deadly sins, all sorts of different kinds of references there with the numbers that would have been something that Christians at this point in time would have really understood readily. The next example on our list is Notre Dame in Paris. This is our last example for the early Gothic. And we're going to be pretty brief here and we're going to focus pretty much on the exterior and the interior and the architecture rather than the decorative parts of the architecture. At Chartres, we spent a lot of time looking at the stained glass and a lot of time looking at the sculpture. And here we're going to spend a little more time looking at the structure. So when we look at the facade, you can see we are starting to see the pointed arch. We are starting to see a little more decoration. We are starting to see the rose window, a little bit larger openings. Uh, but things are still looking like there's a lot of stonework. There is a little more decoration, so it's starting to kind of transition into something that we would identify as Gothic. Notre Dame was the first cathedral that was planned from the beginning to have pointed arches and flying buttresses. So it's very consistent and rational in the way that it's um, applied to the structure. And you can definitely see that as you go around, things are very harmonious. Uh, and the flying buttress is consistently used throughout the structure. Chartres does, or sorry, Notre Dame does have a four part nave elevation. We're seeing that here. You can see how that compares to the interior of Chartres there, which has a three part. So we have the addition, then the bottom layer is the the nave arcade, the second layer is the gallery, the third layer, those little rose window looking things is the triforium and the upper level is the Clara story. Uh, and so what they do as the Gothic goes on, and you can see in comparison to these other Gothic structures is that they leave that four part elevation behind. And that really becomes something that they use only in the early Gothic because they are trying to create as much vertical focus as possible. And that was just one more horizontal division that kind of detracted away from that. Here we're looking uh, down into the interior of the church. You can see those four part nave elevations and how they got rid of it and started to use larger clerestory windows as time went on. Uh, you can see the ribs up in the ceiling. You can see that the bays have not only the X, but then they've got another additional rib, right? So this is six divisions inside each bay. 
that's called sex partite vaulting. Uh, and so that is another kind of common ribbed vaulting that we see in the Gothic. And we just have to remember it, the entirety of the structure is supported by those ribs. As they travel down, they send a little bit of thrust out at the springing. Remember where the rib joins the column. That's where the flying buttress comes into support. But the majority of the uh, thrust is sent down into the ground. And so you have a lighter structure, you have a more stable structure. Uh, and of course they fill in all of those areas between the ribs with very light webbing again as a way to kind of lighten up the structure. So things can be a lot taller than they could have been before. You have more flexibility with that pointed arch and how much space you can span uh, and how tall it has to be in comparison to how wide, right? Because that's very flexible. So a lot of benefits to this pointed arch really could create open space in the walls because of the skeletal nature, nature of the structure and allow for all of that stained glass to come in, allow to create that effect of Lux Nova and allow to create that effect of the heavenly Jerusalem. The nave height here is 112 feet tall, so not necessarily symbolic in this instance. Here with this image, we can see how unified the space is and how repeated those units of space are, right? Creating everything that's very rational, very mathematic, and remember that is a reflection of the scholasticism of the time. Not only can we see the structure, right, and the scholastic approach was all about making things that are unseen seen, right, using scientific methods to prove faith. So you can see the structure, normally that would be hidden, so that's kind of an impact of scholasticism, but also that greater mathematical unity and rationality is also something that we're getting from the scholastic movement of the time.